to summarize briefly, last week we spoke a lot about process integration and thought about SOFCs, particularly the issue of thermal integration. Also in PEMS, a little bit about water management, the problems of humidity and managing the water inside a PEM system. One thing we've been sort of restricting ourselves to so far is the fuel. We're just talking about hydrogen as a fuel. And for polymer electrolyte fuel cells, that is generally the case. Polymer electrolyte fuel cell electrodes are very sensitive to carbon containing species to the point where even small amounts of carbon monoxide that you might have in H2 um, constitute a poison and can permanently deactivate uh, some of the catalysts that are used in polymer electrolyte fuel cells. I think for the application we're talking about, uh, if we're generating hydrogen electrolytically from a renewable source, there's less concern about CO. Um, on the other hand, solid oxide fuel cells, it's a different story. Uh, carbon monoxide can actually be a fuel. And a common approach for SOFCs is to take some type of hydrocarbon, could be reformed natural gas or some other reformed hydrocarbon fuel, and turn it into syngas, a mixture of hydrogen and CO, in order to combust that in the fuel cell reaction. Even if you are you know, thinking about this as a, a purely uh, renewable source, it's possible we may move into an arena where hydrogen, which is generated locally using solar or wind power, is then subsequently processed into other fuels, which allow easier storage. Because hydrogen is a gas that can be put in a pipeline, but the energy density, volumetric energy density is low. Uh, whereas imagine we had atmospheric CO2 capture or some of the technologies like this, we could capture the CO2, take the hydrogen, react with CO2 to form syngas, and then that becomes our pipeline gas. Uh, or we even synthesize liquid fuels using fischer trope synthesis. So there's all kinds of ways that you could potentially take hydrogen that you've made electrocatalytically and turn that into other carbon-based fuels, uh, even if you're doing it renewably. So the bottom line is, you know, fuel cells, SOFCs anyways, can, can uh, operate on hydrocarbons. And um, especially in the short term where people are exploring these things for data centers, which is the application I've been talking about, um, they are using natural gas right now, not hydrogen. So how do you do that? And what is it? What are the implications for that for, for the fuel cell system? I'm going limit, to limit the discussion to methane, but uh, many of the things I'm talking about today can also be applied to other types of fuels, including liquid fuels. So here's, here's the basic idea. If we have a fuel, one thing we can always do is add water to it and undergo a reforming process to form hydrogen. And if we think about sort of Le Chatelier's principle, if we take then the hydrogen and use it up, it's going to drag this reaction to the from left to right. So we have this driving force to constantly be reforming the fuel, putting in the necessary thermal energy, taking away the hydrogen. Both of those things are actually going to help us um, drive the reforming process. And in particular, let's talk about steam methane reforming. which is formally written as methane plus water goes to CO plus three hydrogen. If we look up delta H zero of reaction at 25 degrees C, this reaction is pretty strongly endothermic. So we've got to put in 220 kilojoules per mole to reform methane, which is a lot given that enthalpy of combustion is 800 kilojoules per, per mole. So 25% of that is the amount we would need to, to drive the uh, methane reforming reaction. But the other thing that can happen, we can get even more out of this. If we take the CO itself that we've just made using the steam methane reforming reaction, that will react even further, taking water and form CO2 and H2. So we can make even more hydrogen this way. This is called the water gas shift reaction, sometimes abbreviated WGS, 
uh, steam methane reforming is often abbreviated SMR. And the water gas shift reaction is approximately neutral. It depends on temperature, but at 25 C, it's uh, minus 35 kilojoules per mole. So not strongly endothermic or exothermic. And as you raise the temperature, it actually comes closer to zero. So it's this very um, sort of can go either direction um, from an enthalpic standpoint. If you have a ton of CO and water, it's going to shift to hydrogen. Likewise, if you have a ton of H2 and CO2, it's going to tend to shift to CO. Um, and so those two reactions work together to convert methane into hydrogen. If we're using up the hydrogen, then we're constantly going to be gettering our CH4, converting it to CO, converting the CO to hydrogen, consuming the hydrogen. So we've got this driving force to constantly be taking our fuel and, and reforming it. So these are both good reactions in a sense. Um, there's also one bad one uh, and that's carbon precipitation. Also called coking. The coking reaction, the simplest way to think about it is if I take two carbon monoxide molecules uh, they can react to form CO2 and solid carbon. That'll jam up all of the tubing going into your fuel cell, and it's just a really bad situation. It's called the Boudard reaction with an enthalpy that's somewhat exothermic. One of the issues with the carbon precipitation reaction is that it happens if you don't have enough moisture around. So in fact, if you just have like a compressed cylinder of carbon monoxide gas. Technically, it's unstable. CO will react with itself to precipitate carbon. The one thing is you need some type of catalytic surface for the carbon to precipitate on. It won't easily do this just in the gas. But if you have a surface, and particularly certain catalysts are really good at this, uh, nickel being one of them, nickel is a common anode for SOFCs which is really bad because the nickel will catalyze the coking process. To prevent this from happening, you can't let the CO accumulate. And the way you can fight that is if you look at the water gas shift reaction, if I always am adding water to the system, then I'm whenever I form CO from the steam methane reforming reaction, I'm gonna just be using it up again um, by further shifting it to hydrogen and CO2. Generally speaking, the more water you put into your mixture, the more stable the gas, the fuel gas is relative to coking. There's something called the steam to carbon ratio. The steam to carbon ratio is defined as the, the flow rate of water into our system, into our, in our fuel mixture, divided by um, the flow rate of carbon atoms. So in this case, that would actually just equal the flow rate of the methane. And that's one metric people use to describe uh, the amount of water either that you have or that you need in order to keep coking from occurring. The reforming reactions that I'm talking about can occur in several different places, depending on how you design your system and how you design your stack. One of the simplest to think about is external reforming. What this means basically is we have some separate fuel processing system that takes in methane, takes in water, generates syngas, uh, and that syngas is the fuel that we distribute and use in fuel cell systems. That is sometimes done, not very often. Um, and the reason is usually we want to take advantage of thermal integration. So the more common situation is something called thermally integrated reforming. And the basic idea behind thermally integrated reforming is we have our SOFC stack. And as you'll recall, one of the things that we're always doing whenever we run an SOFC, we're making thermal energy. The idea is to capture as much of the, that thermal energy as possible and recycle it and use it to drive this endothermic fuel processing that we have. Steam methane reforming reaction is, is endothermic. We need to get the heat from somewhere why not use the thermal energy from the stack? So we're basically gonna co somehow collect thermal energy from our stack and feed it into a reformer. A related idea is, is another term that people use is something called indirect internal reforming. The basic idea of indirect internal reforming 
is that we try to incorporate the reformer into the stack design in some way. Like you have your stack and we flow gases that are coming into the stack past it first through a catalyst bed that's sitting right next to the stack. And so you're taking heat directly out of the stack and putting it into the reformer because the two are just literally next to each other. Imagine we had like catalyst beds connected to our stack. We're flowing the fuel this way and then feeding it in to the stack. I would say both of these are sort of basically the same idea, just implemented in a different way. We're taking thermal energy out of the stack, recycling it to help with the fuel processing, either in a separate unit using streams or more integrated as a combined reactor unit with heat transfer surfaces and walls between them. The third category is called direct internal reforming. The basic idea is that somewhere we have our anode and into this anode, we're feeding fuel, which comprises in part our methane. As we feed it in, it reacts in the gas phase or in the catalyst materials comprising the anode to make hydrogen. So we're making hydrogen all the time through steam methane reforming and water gas shift. The hydrogen is going to the fuel cell electrode. And of course we're reacting. So O2 minus is coming through the electrolyte. We are reacting with hydrogen that's being produced. And then we make H2O. And that water is being produced in the same place where the methane is. So the water then reforms the more methane, making more hydrogen and so on. So we're basically using Le Chatelier's principle in the anode compartment to continuously drive this methane toward, uh, toward hydrogen. And then at the same time, we're also taking heat out of the stack because we're, we're driving the reforming process right there at the cell. It's endothermic. We have this exothermic cell. So the heat transfer is right there also. Um, that's why it's called direct internal reforming because we have heat and mass coupling. With thermally integrated and indirect internal reforming, we're only uh, coupling with, with via the heat. This, this aspect of direct internal reforming, I'm actually gonna come back to this a little bit later. We will be talking about stack models and ultimately um, what goes on in a stack where you have methane and reforming going on. For the moment though, I'm just gonna focus on the thermally integrated reforming and indirect internal reforming and think a little bit about what is entailed in you know, predicting some of those reactions.